Hi friends, Happy New Year. I watched very few movies slash TV shows in the month of January, and really only read two books. This may be due to the fact that I've watched over 100 movies and 40 books last year. In any case, I will be combining all of the media that I've consumed in the past month into one video as a way to streamline my thoughts. The first movie I watched this month, and year, was the iconic 1980s action movie Die Hard. This isn't going to start the video off on the right foot, but I found Die Hard to be overrated. Now, before you leave a comment telling me how I'm wrong and an idiot for not thinking Die Hard is the best movie of all time, I'd like to discuss the many positive aspects of the Bruce Willis feature. For starters, the Johnson & Johnson FBI agent bit is the most underrated comedic plotline in the film. The other underappreciated element of the film is the attention to detail regarding character names. Holly Janice for starters. Holly, in reference to the festive plant, and Janice, referring to the two-faced Greek deity. Also, there are at least four references to the name John, or its German equivalent, Hans. As with Holly Janice, the surnames of each of the main characters are worth studying within themselves. That all being said, was giving the main character and the villain the same name, more or less, supposed to have a deeper meaning as to say we are all our own worst enemy? If so, that didn't come across very well based on the written characters of John McClane and Hans Gruber. Moving on to the issues I had with Die Hard. Did the film ever explain why Hans Gruber wanted to steal from the vault in Nakatomi Tower? Money? Priceless art? Sure, there were high stakes, cool explosions, and notable performances all around, especially from Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, but the action didn't really pick up until 40 to 50 minutes into the movie. Also, was there a point to John McClane not wearing shoes? Objectively, it's a great movie in that there isn't anything wrong with it, but it just needed to pick up the pace a little within each scene. If this is one of your favorite films, don't overhype Die Hard to your friends as many fans of the film have. The second movie I watched in the month of January was Toy Story 4. So, the pacing for Toy Story 4 was interesting in that the first half was a bit leisurely while the majority of the second half felt rushed at times, although that one scene at the end with the carousel could have been shortened by a few minutes. There were several seriously funny lines and scenes throughout the film, but the most impressive aspect of Toy Story 4 was the need to feel wanted or to feel safe, as a toy but also as a person. Additionally, Bo Peep and Gabby Gabby acting as each other's foils in terms of feminism could be a discussion worth in and of itself. Additionally, the opening scenes dragged a bit in trying to set up Bo Peep's character, but the montage that followed had me sent. The classic white cloud blue sky wallpaper paired with the Randy Newman banger was like an adrenaline shot of nostalgia just right to the heart. Was it appealing to my attachment to the first three films in order to put me in a good standing for the fourth installment? Yes. But I don't even care. Not since the Carl and Ellie montage from Up has Pixar been able to so effectively emotionally manipulate me. Honestly the most underrated highlight of the film. Not to say the rest of the film wasn't downhill from there, quite the opposite. A good sequel is one that expands on the material of its predecessors while having its own unique themes, which can be said of Toy Story 4. Also, I don't know where else to put this, but the shoutouts to two iconic Kubrick films did not go unnoticed. The next film I watched was the Inbetweeners movie. This might seem harsh, but did this movie need to be made? It might have served the series better to have six seasons in a movie rather than three seasons in two movies, but then again I have yet to see the second Inbetweeners film. The Inbetweeners film didn't take anything away from the series necessarily, but it's difficult to make a case as for why the Inbetweeners movie needed to be made. Moving on to the next film, I rewatched the Bing Crosby movie musical Going My Way. All I have to say is that they just don't make films like this anymore. The last few minutes of the film gets me every time. If you've seen the sequel, The Bells of St. Mary's, please leave your reviews on the second installment of The Father O'Malley Story in the comments below as it is on the extended list of movies for me to watch next. The fourth film I watched this month was The Transporter, starring Jason Statham. A great movie for someone with a short attention span. This film was a complete 180 compared to the slow yet purposeful going my way. The longest scene in The Transporter was possibly 10 minutes, and even the longer scenes were intense action sequences with constantly changing camera angles as a way to keep the viewer's attention. One of the rare occasions where the film was almost too fast-paced, and could have benefited from being more fleshed out. And finally, the last film I watched in the month of January was a 2017 adaptation of A Murder on the Orient Express. 
I had the preconceived notion that this remake of the classic Agatha Christie novel was generally looked down on by most viewers for some reason. That being said, Kenneth Branagh surprised me in terms of the performances from the cast and the stunning cinematography throughout the film. Having read the novel many years prior to watching the film, the final reveal was still filmed in an artistic yet poignant manner. The only complaint I have for this adaptation is similar to The Transporter. Some of the characters could have had more minutes of screen time in order for the ending to make slightly more sense. In addition to watching the Inbetweeners movie, I watched the three seasons of the show The Inbetweeners. For every television show like Skins, there seems to be a The Inbetweeners counterpart. The first season was very cringy, which is kind of the point, but there are great improvements in season two in terms of video quality and writing. Never have I more wanted for a group of young men to get laid before, and I don't know how I feel about that. A common criticism of the show is that it's a bit formulaic, which is fair. Neil is super underrated, as well as Jay's relationship with his father, but for that matter, all the young lads have odd relationships with their fathers. There's a bit too much male genitalia throughout the series, but it's likely that part of the intent of the show was to make the viewer uncomfortable. Mission accomplished. The last thing I have to say about the in-betweeners is the striking similarities the show Dairy Girls has to the 2008 sitcom, purely from a main character archetype analysis. I also watched reruns of The Big Bang Theory seasons 2 through 5, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There are enough videos on YouTube that more accurately praise Buffy than I can, specifically the channel Passion of the Nerd. All I'll say is Oz is perhaps the most underrated character in the Buffyverse. Just try and convince me otherwise. As for the books I read throughout January and February, I only read two series, The Trials of Apollo books 4 and 5, and The Raven Cycle. As much as I would like to go into further detail about The Trials of Apollo, I'll try to keep my thoughts on the series short and to the point. The series may have benefited from condensing the material into a trilogy, focusing on books 1, 3, and 5, but the series was nonetheless a quick and enjoyable read. I will say this. Rick Riordan excels at bringing a series to a close and tying up any loose ends while also hinting at future Greek mythology series. I read books 1 through 3 at the end of 2020. After I finished The Trials of Apollo in January, I started The Raven Cycle with book one, The Raven Boys, which read like a really good meal or a fine wine. Normally I want to finish a book as quickly as possible, but with The Raven Boys, I wanted to take my time with the story. Normally, I listen to audiobooks somewhere between 2 and 2.5 speed, but with The Raven Boys, I listen to the story at 1.8 speed on average throughout. My only complaint was the ending was a bit rushed, but that makes sense as the story of The Raven Cycle is only just the beginning. A great story to read around a campfire or in the dead of night. Five weeks later, I read The Dream Thieves, Blue Lily, Lily Blue, and The Raven King, all in the span of a week. You could say the series is pretty good. You know, not too bad. In all seriousness, there were certain relationship dynamics, without getting into spoilers hopefully, between the main characters in the second and fourth books especially, that had me on the edge of my seat. Some of the relationships were built up slowly throughout the series, and some that I didn't really see coming still made sense in the end, I suppose. I would give the series as a whole 4 out of 5 stars, only in the sense that the supporting characters throughout the series could have been more fleshed out in order to provide a richer backstory. But then again, I can understand why Maggie Stiefvater wanted to focus more so on Blue and the Raven Boys. The only thing holding me back from giving the series 5 stars is how quickly the Raven King ended. Even a few extra pages of development would have been appreciated, the Raven Cycle is still absolutely amazing overall, though. I'm not sure where to put this, but when referencing to Gandhi's Camaro, the Babe homage was not unappreciated. Moving on to what I watched in February. The first film I watched in February was Transporter 3. Not as good as the first Transporter film. And yes, I skipped over the second Transporter installment. In terms of pacing, the first movie never took its foot off the gas, whereas the third film had a lot of stop and go in regards to Valentina's subplot. Similar to the first film, the romance between Frank Martin and the obligatory female romantic interest was flimsy, only with less chemistry between the two main characters somehow. My biggest complaint for the film is how the antagonist was basically a photocopy of a stereotypical bad guy, and came off as tacky and less believable than the villain in the first film. Also, a lot of the physics in the film were questionable at best, but that is to be expected with most action films. While the first Transporter film would be considered entertaining by most viewers, Transporter 3 is kind of meh overall. 
Criticisms aside, many of the action sequences were well choreographed, and the car chase scenes were gripping if not a bit imaginative. Plus, it was nice to see Inspector Tarconi maintained his somewhat unconventional relationship with Frank. The next film I watched was Support Your Local Sheriff. For a film that is over 50 years old, the story held up surprisingly well. There was humor, action, a bit of romance, and was an overall good time. A great family film that is free to watch on YouTube as of the release of this video. Then I watched How to Train Your Dragon 3, The Hidden World. It had been a while since I had seen their second film, but I could remember most of the major plot points. From what I can remember, the villain was much stronger in the second film, but the third How to Train Your Dragons animation was the best amongst the three films, which I'm reluctant to admit based on my profound admiration of the first film. The third movie of the series was definitely the most wholesome, and many viewers may find themselves tearing up, especially in the last few minutes of the film with its homages to the first movie. How to Train Your Dragon is the only animated series to have every installment in its franchise nominated for the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. If not for Toy Story 3, Frozen, and Toy Story 4, the franchise would likely have an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature category as well. Any of the How to Train Your Dragon films are phenomenal and worth watching. The following weekend, I watched The Jungle Book, 2016. While I've yet to see any other Disney live-action remake, somehow, The Jungle Book, 2016 version, is remarkably underrated as far as live adaptations go. While I personally am indifferent to The Jungle Book as far as the story goes, the film deserves all the praise it's received and then some. Critically speaking, there were a few scenes throughout the movie where the story dragged slightly, but no more than 5-10 to 10 minutes as a movie overall. And the final movie I watched in February was the 1970s classic, Smokey and the Bandit. While it might not necessarily be highbrow philosophical commentary on the bigger issues of society, you can't help but root for the bandit to make it to the finish line in time. Is the main focus of Smokey and the Bandit simply a man and his friend trying to illegally drive an 18-wheeler from the Southern Classic in Atlanta to Texarkana and back in 28 hours? Yes. But the film is also about the camaraderie amongst the people who live their lives on highways across the U.S. and the blatant disrespect of state and local law enforcement. There's humor, romance, and a great soundtrack. What's not to like? That all being said, I don't expect to find myself watching the two sequels to Smoking the Bandit. The first installment was received well enough as it is. That's all for now. I'll likely upload on a bi-monthly rate, alternating each month, or once a month if I'm actually organized. Like and subscribe if you want. Okay, bye.